Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is IME470, and today is March the 23rd. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let's share this screen. And let me stop my video. Uh, how to stop video here? Okay. Um, so, uh, let me see. Can everybody see my? Can everybody see my uh, the, the screen? I mean, the part of the slides and also the part of the Excel form here. Can everybody see? Okay, good. I just want to make sure that the the share of the screen works here. Let me see. Uh, let me give me one second. Yes, that's this this screen because I have a double screen here. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Uh, in the very beginning, let me spend some time first to <clears throat> review, have a brief review of Lecture 7 Duality, okay? Uh, because, you know, we just had a long spring break and also during this special time. Um, so, let's go here. Uh, first of all, the duality is something like this. Suppose we, uh, this is the standard primal LP, then the dual is defined in this way. Uh, primal and the duals, as I mentioned before, that they are like twins. You know, they are pretty, pretty close. And the reason we wanna uh, have a look at the dual is that the dual usually gives us some information, very important information about the primal LP. And today we're gonna see two very, very important theorems. Uh, how, uh, for example, if the primal LP is really standard, exactly the form of this way, then uh, we can, you know, just simply by the definition to make the dual. However, the real case is that it's not always standard. For example, uh, in this case, we can see this constraint. Let me, let me do this, give me one second. Uh, let me annotate. So in this way, you can see my mouse is very clear. So in this case, for example, this constraint, it's greater than or equal to six. So that uh, the first method is called a two-step method, uh, which you still remember, <laughs> you know, something before the midterm exam, uh, so that I'm gonna convert it to the standard first. And after it, I'm gonna do what? I'm gonna, you know, so in this way here, both of them gonna be less than or equal to, and this is still a maximum problem. And then I can directly use this definition, you know, uh, convert it to the dual. Uh, another method is the one that I recommended, which is the direct method, mostly based on this table. Uh, basically, you know, just the three plus one phrases, standard to standard, reverse to reverse, <coughs> excuse me, unrestricted to equal, or equal to unrestricted, and the maximum to mean, okay? So using this way for any given LP, you can directly write its dual. And I showed two examples here, and also remember your midterm exam, um, you know, it's also there. So that is basically how you can uh, find the dual. And today, uh, one more thing is the property that the dual of a dual LP is a primal LP. And this one is a problem in the midterm exam as well. Okay, so today we're gonna start uh, something new. Uh, the first is the weak and the duality uh, and the strong duality theorems. So again, uh, we're going to define the primal and the dual in this way. However, as we know that the dual of the dual is a primal, so that I'm going to name it directly as LP1 and I name this one as LP2 instead of from a primal dual, because it doesn't matter. One is a primal and the other must be the dual. Okay, <clears throat> so the weak duality theorem tells you this. For any x feasible to LP1 and for any y feasible to LP2, where I defined LP1 as the maximum LP and LP2 as the mean LP problems. So we must have Z equals to W. Z is the objective value of LP1 and the W is the objective value of LP2. In short, we have Z as less than or equal to W. There are several things I need to mention here. The first thing is, Z is a maximum uh, objective value of the, a maximum problem, okay? And the W is the objective value of the mean problem. However, the weak duality theorem tells us that the objective value of the maximum problem will be less than or equal to the objective uh, value of the mean problem. 
that is something really interesting, right? <laughs> and another thing is that here I mentioned, uh, let me see, a box. Let me draw a box here. How can I draw a box? Oops, here. I mentioned here, can you see it clearly? That X is not necessarily optimal to LP1 and Y is not necessarily to optimal to LP2. In other words, as long as X is feasible to LP1 and Y is feasible to LP2, you always have this weak duality theorem. It doesn't matter uh, their, for example, BFS or their, for example, optimal solutions. It doesn't matter. As long as they're feasible, you have this. Uh, a very special case is that when your Z is the opti uh, optimal value to your LP1 and your W is the optimal value to your LP2. So in this case, we still have Z is less than or equal to W star. In other words, the maximum value of this, uh, max, uh, of this problem is still less than or equal to the minimum value of LP2. That's something really interesting. Actually, in the strong duality theorem, you're gonna see that these two will be equal. But at the current stage, let's pretend that Z is less than or equal to W star. Uh, any questions about this understanding of this weak duality, weak, weak duality theorem? You can unmute yourself and directly talk if you have a microphone. Any questions? No? Okay, uh, let me see how many people are totally here. Uh, participants, uh, how can I see the participant? Let me see. Okay, ah, okay, a lot. Good, uh, you'd better have a video camera because if you direct, <laughs> directly calling, then you cannot see anything. I mean, okay. Then let's see an example before doing so. Let me clear my joints here. Uh, let's use this Excel. Let me quit the what? Go back. Let's use, uh, let's say, example one, ex example seven one, this LP to verify it. So uh, first, let me build X, oops, sorry. Let me build X1, X2, X3. Okay, and our objective function, and I have C, I have how many? Two constraints. So the objective function is two times x1 plus three times x2 plus x3. This is my objective function. C1 is, uh, let's see, equals to x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus one. I, I make minus ones because I want to use the uh, zero in all right hand sides. So make my life easier. And this one equals to negative x1 plus two times x2 plus two times x2 plus <clears throat> a minus three times x3 minus six and x1 to three are greater than or equal to zero. Okay, now let's solve it. Use the Excel solver. For example, here, changing variables are here and let's use LP add things, everything less than or equal to zero. Okay. As you can see, the maximum value uh, of this problem is a three. Uh, I'm talking about the optimal uh, value of this problem. And the, the dual problems here, let's formulate it. Y1, Y2, and the OBJ equal to Y1 plus six times Y2. And we have three constraints Oops. and then okay and then uh, let's set equal to y1 minus 
y2 minus 2, and this equals y1 plus 2 times y2 minus 3, and this equals to y1 minus 3 times y2 minus 1. And then let's solve this again. Uh, that object value, Oops. make it to this number, and the change of variables are going to be here. And this, let's delete and add. We're going to have everything here is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, oh, good. That means some, somewhere the settings are wrong. Let me see. Um, G8 and the changing variables are these two, and all of them are greater than or equal to zero. G10 to G12. Uh, let me see. Where is wrong? Plus six. Ah, it's a main problem, sorry. This is a main problem, not a maximum problem. Okay, and here's something interesting, guys. Uh, look here, the objective function of this problem, which is a main problem, you see. The main problem, the objective, uh, the optimal value, in other words, the minimal value equals to three. And this is a maximal problem, its objective value is also equal to three. That means what? That means if any feasible so, uh, solution to this y, it must be greater than or equal to three, right? I mean, the objective uh, value here must be greater than or equal to three. Why? Because the minimum is three. So any feasible must be, uh, if you substitute the y1, y2 to this objective function, it, the value must be greater than or equal to three. And correspondingly, have a look at this LP, the LP1. The maximum value is three. In other words, if anything feasible, any axis is feasible to this problem, the primal LP or the LP1, then the objective value must be less than or equal to three. For example, let's randomly, uh, you know, make two solutions for fun. For example, suppose I have x1, x2, x3 equals to, uh, let's see, uh, what the value should be. Let's say x1, uh, let's set x1 equal to one and uh, x2 equal to zero, x3 equal to zero, for example. So that you can see one plus zero plus, plus zero less than or equal to one. And here I have negative one is less than or equal to six. Yes, this is the optimal solution. And if this is the case, how about the objective value here? It equals to two, you can see, okay. And how about here, suppose I have y1, y2, suppose let me randomly make a solution. Uh, uh, let's say y1 equals to three and y2 equals to zero. So if this is the case, what is the objective value of your dual problem? You're gonna have, uh, here's zero. You're gonna have three plus zero equals to three, okay? Oh, give me one second, let me have a look. Okay, so, oops, sorry. So in this case, it's very clear. I have the objective value of this one is less than the objective value of this one because two is less than three. In this way, we have already verified this uh, weak duality theorem by this example one, clear? Because it tells you that the Z should be less than or equal to W. So correspondingly, let me see, this would be Z and this gonna be W. And indeed, Z in this case is less than W. And in this case, Z, let me still put a Z here, equals to W. Any questions here? No question? Uh, you are very welcome to, 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 you know, to, to, to ask any questions. You, what do you need to do just to unmute yourself, you know, by clicking the Zoom here and unmute it, then you can talk. Just, you know, as you are in uh, uh, a class.
No question? Oh. Looks, <laughs> looks people are very quiet uh, during the online uh, class. Okay, so uh, weak duality theorem is important. The main reason is because in almost any optimization problem, weak duality, oops, weak duality theorem holds. Uh, here we are talking about uh, linear programs. If it's nonlinear, we can correspondingly, you know, uh, de define the dual problem as, for example, Lagrange dual. And we still have the weak duality theorem that the objective value of a minimum problem is greater than or equal to the objective value of a maximum problem. That is something really interesting. Uh, one very important application is that in this way, we can have the so-called primal dual algorithms. That one is the, a maximum problem, but the value is going to be smaller. The other is a minimum problem, but the value is going to be bigger. And we can just iteratively you know, solve the, pro, uh, the maximum and mean and maximum and the mean. And then finally, once they hit a common point, or let's say once they uh, hit at a relatively stable gap in nonlinear programs, then this will be the solution. Okay. Uh, the next thing that I want to introduce is the strong duality theorem. The difference is that weak duality theorem, as I mentioned, that it works for almost you know all optimization problems. But the strong duality theorem it only works in general. Okay, it only works for LP linear programs. So the strong duality theorem tells you that if X star is the optimal solution to LP1 and the Y star is the optimal solution to LP2, then I must have the objective, objective values of these two. In other words, Z star and the W star, they must be equal. This is a very, very, very strong condition because this tells you that to solve the main problem is equivalent to solve the maximum problem. There's no difference here at all. But by comparison, say we're comparing uh, the weak duality theorem and the strong duality theorem, one big difference is that in the weak duality theorem, let me draw a box here, draw a box here. In the weak duality theorem, it just describes the relationship between you know any feasible solution, the, I should say the pairs of any feasible solutions. For example, here we have x as any you know uh, feasible solution to LP1 and y is any feasible solution to LP2. However, in the strong duality theorem, we must guarantee that the x star is the optimal solution and the y star uh, to LP1 and the y star is the optimal solution to LP2. Of course, optimal solution must be feasible, right? So in this case, we must have CT X star equals to BTY or equivalently the Z star equals to W star. And another thing as what? Well, another thing uh, is that the strong duality theorem for LP is because as we have seen uh, from the graphical method, LPs are all what? Their uh, feasible solutions are all simplex. Okay, so in this in this case, it's it's really simple. You know, uh, you can easily ver geometrically verify that they don't have any gap, and we're gonna verify uh, by this example as well. Actually, it is already here. Have a look here. So this is actually your z star, right? I should write it in this way. Let me make it to be z star, and this is actually your w star. And indeed, you can see the Z star equals to the W star equals to three. So this is the result of the strong duality theorem. And of course, a, a very, very easy uh, interpretation is because this is, you know, the minimum obje uh, objective value. And this one is the maximum objective value uh, to LP1. So that if they are equal, then of course, the strong, du sorry, the weak duality theorem that this one must be greater than or equal to this one must hold. That is, you know, a simple interpretation from the strong duality theorem to the weak duality oops, to the weak duality theorem. However, strong duality theorem is not easy to uh, be proved. 
And since this is basically an undergrad level class, I'm not gonna prove the strong duality theorem. However, the weak duality theorem is very, very easy to be proved. I can simply show the proof here. Let's see. Uh, let me make it a bit bigger so that you can see it more clear. Oops, let's see. Uh, let's say page 11 here. Uh, proof to proof to the weak duality theorem. Okay, how to prove it? Uh, the first thing is that suppose X is a feasible solution to LP1 and a Y is a feasible solution to LP2, okay? Then um, by the feasibility of X and Y and also the constraints of LP1 and LP2, we have the following. Let me make this to be formulas here. Oops, make it a bold. Okay. So I have W equals to BTY and have a look at it here. I know B is greater than or equal to AX. And I know Y is greater than or equal to zero. That means what? That means I can multiply, you know, uh, let's say in this case, we have BT is greater than or equal to XTAT, right? The AXT, let me write it this way. This is greater than or equal to AXTY. And all these are bold because they are all vectors or matrices. Actually, I only one matrix here, A. Again, the reason is because from this constraint, I have B is greater than or equal to AX and Y is greater than or equal to zero. So that you can multiply, you know, a non-negative thing on both sides uh, of the constraint, uh, of this constraint. And this equals to what? This equals to AT, X, sorry, XT, AT, and multiplies Y. Okay, now what is this? Have a look at this constraint. I know that ATY is greater than or equal to C. So that, let me write in this way, so that. Oops. Okay. So that this one is greater than or equal to XTC. And XTC is what? XT equal to CTX, of course. Which is what? CTX here as Z. Okay. So in this way, we actually proved indeed W should be greater than or equal to Z. So this is a very, very simple proof of the weak duality theorem. And also remember in your midterm exam, uh, I think the bonus question, it is something very similar. That's actually uh, a, a proof for the weak duality theorem, a variation of the weak duality theorem actually, okay? Any questions here regarding the weak and the strong duality theorem? Yeah, I have a, I have a quick question. Yes. Professor. Yes. Um, would you kind of go around solving the strong duality theorem by like reverse solving it? Like uh, basically finding the optimal solution in the original LP and then uh, finding the optimal solution based off of those X values? Give me one second. Um, so here, let me, let me quit the full mode here. You are talking about using the other one, right? Because here I, I use this, uh, let me see. I use this formulation. Oh, no, this LP is standard. The one that we're doing here, it is a standard. So, I mean, it doesn't matter use which method to, 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 to solve it. And uh, no matter what, we are gonna have this one. No matter, we, I have the, there's no two step. There's only one step here. So uh, that is how I, let's say, um, how I have this uh, uh, dual problem and I solved the problem here. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. 
do, do you need me to repeat it? I mean, repeat the operations here? Because this, uh, the purpose I'm doing here is in the left side here, I'm solving this primal LP, which is our LP1. And here, I'm formulating and solving LP2, which is the dual problem. And here you can see that indeed the W star equals to, to uh, Z star. And in this part, I actually just you know randomly make a feasible solution to LP1 and a feasible solution to LP2. And I verified that for this case, I have W greater than uh, uh, Z, which is still, you know, in our weak duality theorem. So here, <clears throat> excuse me, here actually I ver I've already verified the strong duality theorem, and here it is a verification of the weak duality theorem. Does Thank it you. help? Yeah, no, yeah, I was just wondering for kind of how you would go about proving the strong duality theorem. Uh, right, how I go about what? Proving the strong duality theorem. Oh, okay. Um, Proving strong duality theorem is really not a simple task. <laughs> I can honestly tell you it's gonna spend, I think the whole class and the proof is gonna be very, very mathematical and very, very long. You basically, uh, you have two methods to prove it. You have to use Minkowski re representation theorem. And the second method is you're gonna use the fundamental theorem of the linear program. And uh, none of them <laughs> were included or, or were introduced in this class before. So, you know, and uh, you know, that's why I don't want to improve this strong duality theorem here. It's, it's a really, really long, I can tell you. <laughs> All right. However, if you are interested, I can, I can, I can show you, let's say, uh, a paper or some part. I, I don't know whether in the textbook it includes a proof or not. I, I'm not pretty sure. But uh, you can shoot me an email. I can show you the proof. I mean, but be prepared. It's going to be a very, very mathematical and a very long proof. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, uh, let's continue. So the, the strong and the weak duality theorems are two super, super, I would say the most important theorems for the duality of LP. Um, another question is how about the cases, uh, about uh, I would say the relationship between the primal and the dual pairs of the LPs in terms of the feasibility. So we actually have only four cases. First is that both the primal and the dual problems are infeasible. And the case, cases two and three are that one of them is infeasible and the other is unbounded. It doesn't matter which one is a primal, which one's a dual. You know, again, it's because the primal of the, pri sorry, the, the dual of the dual is the primal. And the case number four, is that both of them are feasible and they have the same optimal values. Be careful here, in your slides, uh, I think I made a typo before that here I wrote as optimal solutions. This is wrong, be very careful. It should be optimal values, this part. Let me, let me highlight here. Oops. Uh, for the online tool, one thing not easy that I cannot direct it right. Otherwise, it's gonna be much easier. So uh, please check your slides. If you, uh, you know, just print it or if you downloaded the slides before, make sure you, 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 you know, correct this typo. It should be optimal values instead of optimal solutions, okay? So um, the thing for the case for the uh, fourth one, we have just verified, okay? And uh, both of them are in infeasible, it's also very easy. And one is unbounded, one is in infeasible. This one we will verify in the next class and you're gonna see some <clears throat> cases. Uh, be careful that we do have two impossible cases. The first impossible case is that one of the primal or the dual is feasible, but the other is abnormal. Ab abnormal means it is either unbounded or infeasible. This is impossible. And the second case is that both of them are unbounded. This is also impossible, okay? So totally there are, you know, one, two, three, four, and here I have actually how many cases? Uh, one, two, uh, I'll, this A also includes the four cases, and uh, this uh, B is one case. So totally I have nine cases, but only four of them are possible that you can really see in practical LPs. Again, there are 
uh, either both of them are infeasible or one of them is a feasible, infeasible and the other is unbounded or both of them are feasible and have the same optimal values. After this, another problem, very important problem is how would you find the solution to the dual LP? Because here, it just tells you, the strong duality theorem just tells you that the optimal values of the two problems are the same, yes. But how about the solutions? In some cases, I may be interested to know what is the optimal solutions to Y, rather than the optimal values about this. Of course, a very, very simple and intuitive way is to formulate the dual and resolve it, like what we, like what we did here. So I just resolve the dual problem and I know, oh, okay, the optimal solution is y1 equal to one, y2 equal to zero. The question is this example is really, really small. What if we have an LP, let's say, with, let's say, 1,000 variables? You are not gonna really, you know, start from zero, you know, uh, to solve everything. It's gonna be very, very time consuming. Is there a way, uh, you know, we may ask that we can solve it kind of like easier? Or let's say this, suppose I've already had, I, I already have the optimal solution to LP1, the primal LP here. Suppose I solve it by the simplex method so that I already have the optimal simplex tableau. Is there a way that I can easily know the optimal solution to Y, I mean, to the dual problem? Actually, yes, there, there exists one very, very simple method. And the hint is that, again, don't forget that a variable in the dual is what? As a constraint in what? In the X, oh, sorry, a uh, uh, constraint in the primal. For example here, uh, remember, when we formulated the dual here, I always asked you to write a Y1, Y2, a corresponding Y after each constraint. This tells you that this Y1 is corresponding to the first constraint. And the second dual variable y2 is corresponding to the second constraint in the primal LP. Okay, and if we're writing this way, do you remember something similar? For example, you may uh, have a look at lecture six. Let me open lecture six here. Sensitivity analysis. Oops, why it is here? How can I drag it here? Okay, I can put it here. So in lecture six, let's go to sensitivity analysis. Uh, where is the sensitivity? Sorry, let's go to the shadow price, not sensitivity analysis. The shadow price is something similar. That the definition is the marginal value of a constraint. For each constraint, there's a shadow price, right? And remember, we have a way to simply read the shadow price, which is which is here. Remember it? It's in uh, lecture six, okay? Slide. 19. The next theorem is going to tell you something very, very amazing. That the optimal solution to the dual LP actually equals to the shadow price of the same constraint of the primal LP. Of course, we assume the primal LP has optimal solution. That means as long as you can read the shadow price, you can directly read the solution, the optimal solution to the dual primal. That is really, really amazing. So that you don't need to resolve the dual again and again. You know what I mean? For example, we can compare this and this, they are the same. The primal, if the primal problem is a maximal problem and the constraint type is less than or equal to, like this way, then the y j star, meaning the optimal solution uh, to in the dual problem, the j is a variable, directly equals to the uh, a coefficient of the slack uh, variable of CSJ in the zero of the optimal simplex tableau. And have a look at this one. If the original problem is the standard LP, that means it's a maximum and less than or equal to here, then the shadow price of constraint I equals to the con uh, coefficient of the corresponding slack variable in the zero from the optimal uh, simplex tableau of the original LP. Here, the original LP is equivalent to the primal LP here, and the shadow price is equivalent to the optimal solution of the corresponding dual variable here, of the j variable 
corresponding to the jth constraint in the prime LP, okay? And what if it's a maximum and a constraint as greater than or equal to, see here, maximum greater than or equal to, you have yj equal to negative coefficient. Similarly, in the shadow price, it is negative coefficient. If it's a maximum, uh, let's skip the equal sign here. Let's go uh, to these two cases. If it's a minimum less than or equal to constraint, then your yj equal to negative coefficient. The same thing here. And uh, if it's a maximum, uh, sorry, if it's a main problem and the constraint is greater than or equal to, then your yj star equal to coefficient here mean greater than or equal to the yj equal to coefficient. You can see that they're exactly the same. The only two cases that I did not mention in lecture six uh, are the cases if the constraint sign is equal, no matter it's a maximum or minimum. The maximum is here, uh, where's my box? Let me, let me draw two boxes. I'm talking about these two cases. They're relatively new because I did not mention them in lecture six. If the problem, the primal problem is a maximal problem and uh, spotlight, and uh, the constraint sign is equal here, then the y equals to the coefficient of a one uh, of aj, where aj is the added artificial variables by the big M method. For example, suppose you see the coefficient is two plus three n, then you are gonna say that the dual solution is two. You're gonna exclude the m its, and its coefficient. And similarly, if the problem is the main problem, then it equals to the negative coefficient, excluding m. For example, suppose, again, you have two minus three m, then the uh, dual optimal solution is gonna be negative two. No worry, we are gonna see examples after it. Let's see, oops, clear clear drawing. Okay, let, let me put this one here. Otherwise, you may not see what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm just, you know, operating this as somewhat like the eraser in my class that I always forget, and also the pointer and the markers. A uh, good point is that in the online education, I will never forget my erasers and my markers. Okay, uh, there are several remarks here. The first one is that, again, you know, exactly the same as here. For all main problems, the coefficient means they are from the optimal tableau, simplex tableau of the maximum negative problem, okay? And also the dual LP means the dual formulated by the direct method rather than this two-step method. What does that mean? For example, again, go back to uh, example seven one. Uh, sorry, let's, let's go to example seven two because seven one is a standard one. Seven two is not standard. So first we can have a dual in this way because this is uh, from the two-step method. And remember I showed, it in, I showed it in the whiteboard, I think last Monday, no, last, last Monday, the last class before the midterm exam, I can also formulate it in this way. Here's a good comparison. And look, the Y2 here equals to the negative Y2 here. Remember it, I wrote it on the whiteboard. Okay, then you may be confused because if you directly you know, read the optimal solution from this method, so which one, which dual problem are you actually reading? Okay, so this remark tells you that you're actually reading the dual problem from the direct method. And that's also the reason why I emphasize that you are highly recommended you know, solving the dual or reading the dual by the direct method rather than the two-step method. In other words, if we go back to uh, example two, uh, seven two, you're actually reading the optimal solution to this LP instead of this LP. Why? Because this LP requires you that Y2 is greater than or equal to zero. But here, you have to make Y2 less than or equal to zero, okay? And the third remark of this method is that, again, we can solve the primal and the dual LPs simultaneously you never need to solve them you know, separate one by one, which is really, really time consuming. Actually, you're gonna double the time, right? Okay, let's see several examples regarding how to read the dual optimal solutions in the next. First of all, let's consider this LP. 
So the optimal solution, the optimal tableau of the maximum problem, again, remember remark uh, number one, if it's a mean uh, problem LP, then we're gonna consider the simplex tableau, optimal simplex tableau of this, the maximum negative objective function, okay? There's a negative here. So in this case here, yes, first we convert it to ma negative maximum of negative two x1 minus three x2. And this tableau is the optimal tableau of this maximum problem. And here we go. Remember, here we say that we can directly read it. And the method is exactly the same as the shadow price here. Let's read. I hope you still remember, you know, after the midterm exam and a long holiday, you still remember how to read the shadow price, okay? <laughs> okay, so the first constraint, the problem is a mean problem and the constraint type is less than or equal to, right? Let me, let me put a box here. Mean problem less than or equal to. So it equals to what? Equals to the negative coefficient. For your convenience, I'd already put uh, something here. You can see mean less than or equal to and the shadow price, which is also, you know, the optimal solution to the dual as negative coefficient. So that it's equal to negative zero here. Let me draw zero here. Okay. And of course, negative zero is still zero. For the second constraint, it's a mean problem. And uh, give me one second. Where it is? It's here. It's a mean problem and greater than or equal to. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, main problem and also less than or, or equal to. And similarly, it's negative coefficient here of this number, zero. And again, negative zero equal to zero. For the third constraint, it's a main problem and the greater than or equal to, you know, the constraint type. Then it's here. If it's a main problem greater than or equal to, it is coefficient. So that it equal to positive zero. And for the fourth constraint, I have what? maximum greater than or equal to. And similarly, it's gonna be constrained so that my optimal solution of y4 equal to two. Again, one constraint in the primal is one decision variable in the dual. Okay, so y1 is corresponding to constraint one, y2 constraint two, y3 constraint three, and y4 constraint four, okay? So in this way, I can directly read it. I don't have to resolve it. Get a point? Any questions here? And be careful. Here, the dual that I'm talking about is the dual formulated by the direct method, okay? Not formulated by the two-step method. Otherwise, you're gonna see something is kind of like the opposite uh, sign. Like what I mentioned uh, in the previous example that a y2 may equal to negative another y2. You know, that, that's gonna be a chaos. Here, everything, the definition of the dual is by the direct method. Any questions? No? Okay, uh, let's clear my joints. Now let's go to the, sec uh, let me make it this way, the second example. So now we can make it bigger to see it more clear. And this, uh, oh, where it is, here. In the second example, uh, because we mentioned what equal constraint. So here I do have a equal constraint, which is corresponding to Y3, okay. So the dual is in this way. Now what we're gonna do is that we are gonna directly read the dual from the optimal tableau. Uh, this optimal tableau is directly for the primal LP and we did use the big M method so that you're gonna see, you know, the big M's here. First of all, remember the big M method? Suppose, you know, my optimal solution is not related with M or in other words, all basic feasible solutions here Oh, sorry. In other words, non-basic feasible solution here is related with the artificial variables. Then what? Then I can claim that this LP is a feasible, right? And indeed, the optimal solution is given this way. X2 equal to, sorry, X2 equal to 6 phi over 23, uh, X3 equal to this, X5 equal to this, and all other Xs and all artificial variables, A2 and A3 are what? Are zero. And of course, the corresponding z equal to five six five over twenty six. Okay, and have a look at here. If it is equal, then if the problem type is a maximum, then y j is directly the coefficient of a i. If if uh, the type of the problem is a mean problem, then y j equal to negative coefficient of a i. Let's have a look at here. 
So uh, first, let's have a look at the y1. Okay, so for a y1, it's a maximum type and the less than or equal to. So it's a standard. So y1 should directly equal to here. Let me draw it. Should directly equal to the coefficient of the corresponding select variable x4 in the optimal tableau of the primal LP, which is 51 over 23. And indeed, we are correct. And the second case is a maximum problem, but greater than or equal to. So that my y2 optimal solution is going to be negative coefficient, which means y2 star equal to negative 58 over 23. And for the third case, uh, let, me, let me see here. My y3, be careful, here's a maximum and an equal constraint, see it? And if it's a equal constraint, we're gonna read this part because a3 is corresponding to the artificial variable used in the third constraint. And then we can see what? The coefficient here is, <coughs> excuse me, is m plus 20, uh, 9 over 23. M plus one uh, over uh, nine over twenty three, and as we mentioned here, the optimal solution of y three equals to this directly the coefficient of uh, a three, dropping m, so that it's directly equal to nine over twenty three. Why dropping m? Because of this. Oops. Stop. Stop. Because of this here, maximum equal y equals to coefficient of aj as excluding m and its coefficient. For example, if it is 2 plus 3m, then you get 2. So the same here, it is 9 over 23 plus m. So you drop this m, or the coefficient of m, and you directly get y3 equal to 9 over 23. And you can actually verify that your w star also equal to this number. Uh, let's check whether it's correct. Let me open another one. So here I have x1, x2, and x3. Okay, and the objective function equals to what? Equals three times x1 plus two times x2 plus five times x3. Okay, and your constraints are cs2, cs3. Your constraints are uh, x1, plus three times x2 plus two times x3. Uh, in my laptop, it's really not easy to, to, to type all these numbers. Next time I'm gonna use a sum of product. I'm kind of like lazy to really make it directly on the whiteboard, uh, on, my, on, my what, on my laptop, two times x2 minus x3. <coughs> minus uh, five here, right? Yes. And the third thing equals two times x1 plus x2 minus five times x3 minus 10. Okay, and if we are gonna solve it, data, data, uh, oops, sorry, not data, no, what it is. Solver, we're gonna solve the maximum problem of here and the changing variables are here and uh, LP and the adding constraints. Uh, let me see, this one is less than or equal to zero. And uh, this one is greater than or equal to zero. And the next one and this one equal to zero. Okay, and you're gonna solve this number. And uh, let's verify it. For example, uh, let's say, 565 divided by 23. See, they're the same. So this tells you that this number is indeed 565 over 23. Now let's check your y, the dual variable. The, sorry, the dual LP. So here I have y1, oops, sorry. Here's a typo, I just, I just see it. Here, it should be y1, y2, y3 instead of x1, x2, x3. Sorry, here, here's a typo. Should be y1, y2, y3, please, you know, correct it. Okay, now let's. Let's come here. The objective function equal to 15 times, oops, equal to 15, 15 
times uh, y1 plus phi times y2 plus 10 times y3. Okay, the constraints. Okay, I, I really cannot tolerate anymore. Let me directly use sum of product. Zero, two, and three, one, three, two, one. Uh, two, negative one, negative five. Okay, it's gonna make my life much easier. Equal, yeah, is this one equal to some product of this and this. So this means one times y1 plus uh, zero y2 plus two times y3, the same as my first constraint, okay? Minus three. And the second constraint is similar, you sum product, this is an easy way, you know, you can do in Excel times uh, versus three to one, meaning the coefficients of three to one here and the minus two. And the third one equal to sum product. Uh, constraint three minus five. Okay. And correspondingly, I'm gonna minimize, I'm not gonna make the same mistake. I'm gonna minimize this one and the change of variables are gonna be here. And then let me delete, delete all of them. Delete, delete, oops. And let's make new variables, which are, okay, y's are relatively simple. Everything's just greater than or equal to zero. So, eh, what's zero? Uh, let me see. Did I make any stupid mistake again? Probably yes. Uh, uh, let me see why it is. Ah, okay, great. I see. I see the reason. The reasons because uh, here, because again, the the problem here. Uh, actually, here you can see the. This the, uh, this constraint, I, I, I will uh, change this, this slide, slide number 18, after the class. Uh, the sign of y1, it's a maximum less than or equal to its standard. So y1 should be greater than or equal to zero, correct. But y2 should be less than zero. Here's a problem. Because that's a maximum and greater than or equal to, and y3 should be unconstrained. And that's the reason why the solution here, you know, it's gonna be zero. They should be exactly the same due to the due, uh, strong duality theorem. So let's change it. Uh, I should have y1 only is greater than or equal to zero, and I should have y2 as less than or equal to zero, and y3 is nothing. So here I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna click here. I'm not gonna take this one, make unconstrained variables non-negative because yes, y3 could be negative. Oh, still wrong. That's interesting. Uh, let me think about this. Is there anything wrong here? Because they should be the same. Oh, what happened here? Objective cell value not con uh, not uh, converge. Let me have looked here. F8. Uh, let me confirm that this one's correct. Anyway, uh, due to the time limit, I know it's already five minutes uh, longer than the average. Uh, I will uh, uh, check this point and uh, fix it uh, in the class of Wednesday. Okay, uh, that's all. Let me go back to my video. Okay, uh, that's all of the class today. Thank you very much and see you on Wednesday. Please feel free to contact me by email or something if you have uh, more comments or let's say uh, any suggestions on the online teaching. Thank you very much. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.